we are delighted to have with us today for our podcast series, uh, Jeffrey Zeig, one of the most eminent psychotherapists in the world, uh, I think is safe to say, and somebody that has influenced practicing psychotherapists by the thousands who listen to Jeff in your global conferences and read your books and uh, you've, you've created an extraordinary career. Uh, Jeff is the founder and director of the Milton H. Erickson Foundation. He's edited and co-edited, authored or co-authored more than 20 books on psychotherapy that appear in 14 foreign languages. He is the architect of the evolution of psychotherapy conferences, which are considered the most important conferences in the history of psychotherapy and I know have enrolled thousands at a time in these conferences. Uh, in fact, a psychotherapist that I had working with my wife, uh, I mentioned the word Jeffrey Zeig and I thought she was gonna get down and genuflect. Uh, <laughs> so she has been in your master classes. Uh, he organizes the brief therapy conferences, the couples conferences, and international congresses on Ericksonian approaches to hypnosis and psychotherapy. Also a psychologist and marriage and family therapist in private practice in Phoenix, uh, Dr. Zai conducts workshops internationally in 40 countries and is president of Zai Tucker Tyson, publishers in the behavioral sciences. We are thrilled to have uh, you here, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know you over the last couple of years and uh, really uh, appreciate the depth of your knowledge and experience. We uh, invited you here because um, of that expertise and wondering, which is like what we would like to talk about today, of how that can translate potentially to the problems faced specifically by family member caregivers who find themselves in a very difficult role without any training, without resources, without appreciation, without reward, and without uh, a, a way out <laughs> uh, for so or many. Without a happy ending. And, and, and without a happy ending. Yeah, this is sort of like a very bad drama that you are in it, you can't get out of it. And uh, um, so, you know, your work on coping and adapting to these kind of situations, we thought could be really valuable in uh, thinking through some of these things. Jeff, I'm curious, how, how do you split your time between um, counseling patients and educating clinicians and uh, therapists and writing books and, and writing books and jobs and being on camera the public and, and everything yeah. else running an empire <laughs> yeah well uh, I, I'm, I'm retired so i'm doing <laughs> things that i love and the things oh, that it's so you thought. hard to hard to know this, so this is my thought. retirement yeah, I, I'm blessed, and uh, I've uh, you know created a, 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 a team that helps me to do all of the different things that I'm capable of doing, and uh, it's been a really uh, wonderful life so far, and uh, no reason to not look forward to even more. The things that are important to me are making a contribution, and making a contribution to your project is. Uh, fits within the, the realm of what it is that, that is meaningful for me. We're excited to have you here. I've been, I've been hearing about you from Don and David. So I'm personally just thrilled that you're here and, and to meet you and to hear what you've got to say. I know this isn't absolutely an area you're, you're active in, but I've taken a few notes and David and I have spoken and everything... I've gleaned from your writings and your presentations uh, are completely relevant as far as I can I tell. So I hope I can be, I hope I can, can have something to contribute. I think it's a great project. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I mean, when you uh, listen to what we had to say in that first one, that overview, did it 
trigger in your mind directions that you might provide some input on uh, or were they consistent in some ways with you know your approach recognizing that you're teaching either teaching other psychotherapists or you're providing direct counseling to individuals and families well you know my area of inquiry is about conceptual realizations and how do you realize that you're a share giver what what does it take for you to realize um, that you're motivated, responsible, connected, curious, creative, whatever the concept is that you need to realize. So uh, my practice stems from hypnosis and what what is necessary for somebody to realize that they're in a hypnotic state and how can that be generalized, but also um, how to deal with adversity you know, this yeah. is uh, a, another theme that we all have to deal with. And what does it take for people to rise to the occasion? I was reading one thing you said. I don't know if it was on the art of psychotherapy. And in part, you were touching on metaphor and poetry and sort of this transcendence as part of opening up, you know, enabling somebody. But you said something that I paraphrased a little bit that psychological problems stem from a person believing that they have limitations, that they don't have the resources to change or to cope and need to feel that there are possibilities. How can we pave the way I inserted for the caregiver to activate in an empowering way to cope with change and to live in adaptive harmony with the current environment or situation from you and and to me, That is really at the crux of what we are hoping to inform or, you know, provide some assistance that way. Yeah, what we know in our left hemisphere and what we realize in our heart and our more inner spirit are two different things. And there needs to be an experiential realization that empowers knowledge into realization. And that experience, uh, unfortunately, could be traumatic and suddenly it brings something out of you and being uh, humane and caring and uh, uh, transcending some of the obvious difficulties of a situation is something that unfortunately may be prompted by trauma. It could be prompted by some other things that are less difficult in the human spirit, but we want to all rise, be able to rise to the occasion. Well, we're so glad you're here. Um, Where do you see the crossover in sort of this uh, critical juncture people find themselves in? You know, one day life is pretty smooth and sweet. And the next day you get a a, a, diagnosis, diagnosis, not necessarily a death sentence at the time, but I think that's how it's perceived in many cases. And you go from hopeful to hopeless in a day. Yep. We're we're all in a precarious situation because uh, life is a ephemeral condition and we're all going to come to some difficult end at some time. And I have been blessed to meet a lot of people who knew how to deal with adversity. When I graduated from high school in New York, I had to write an essay and they gave me a topic. I wasn't even sure I knew what it meant, but it was adversity is the test of a strong person. Mm. And I wrote an essay comparing a character in, uh, uh, from Jack London to Babbitt, who in Sinclair Lewis's book, who fell apart at every possible moment. And how do you, move, how do you bring out something inside yourself? Now, bringing out connection or bringing out faith or bringing out meaning or bringing out creativity. There's something that exists inside you, and it may take the adversity for that to condense and and congeal and become an identity for you. And being a share giver 
is uh, something that is we're not necessarily born into. But suddenly when somebody who we love, like happened to David, is stricken, we need to find whatever it is inside ourselves to find our emotional spine, our spiritual spine, and allow ourselves to build uh, some flesh around that and to transcend the abject difficulty of the situation and be uh, resonant and rise to the occasion. And, and how is that done? Well, you know, there, there could be a progression and there doesn't necessarily need to be a progression. There's an idea. Let's take a, an example of responsibility. Like uh, you want your adolescent child to be responsible. So you try to teach your adolescent child, but the adolescent child already has the idea. The adolescent child needs to have a conceptual realization now that may happen from falling in love, getting a job, taking care of a pet, being in a sports team. And suddenly the adolescent implicitly realizes I can be responsible. Now it may take another experiential event to become an orientation. I will be responsible. And it may take another experiential event to solidify the state. I'm being responsible, which may take another evocative event to change an identity. I am a responsible person. Now you could go from the idea of responsibility to the realization of an identity of being responsible. Uh, and you, don't, you wouldn't necessarily need those intermediate steps, but for the purpose of discussion, I present the intermediate steps that what it takes for somebody to deeply identify with the realization that this is what is valuable, this is what's meaningful, this is what's really important, and then to be able to assume that role. Now, that's not to say that everybody can do that, and that's not to say that everybody can find a resource within themselves. So that's why part of your project, one of the triads of your project, is reaching out and getting some help and recognizing that it takes a village to deal with these situations and trying to be brave and do this alone is not enough. There needs to be some support system that's put into place so the caregivers can do what it is that they um, can aspire to do and do it well and do it meaningfully and do it with some sense of personal pride. Yeah, the, it's interesting because these uh, caregivers are so trapped in sort of this inertial warp that it's hard for them to reach out. I think it's generally hard for people to ask for help, but this group particularly, I think, falls under the same stigma that, that attaches to the person they're caring for. It's really uh, you know, sort of paralyzing in a way. And I've talked to so many that don't really even have the, their, the activation to, to seek help or the resources if it's professional help. And it's, so one of the things that we're doing is providing sort of techniques or even props like a calendar, like a whiteboard that they can make it easier for them to reach out because on their own, they're not doing it. The information alone can be helpful that people get caught in rut and they don't recognize that they need some sustenance from the outside, some vitamins from the outside. We all need vitamin C. We can't manufacture that in our own body. It has to come externally. So uh, the caregivers can get the caregivers can easily get into a rut where they don't believe that they need sustenance, that they need to be energized from the outside. And then everything becomes flat and perfunctory and people are just doing a job and their functions and not human beings anymore. Mm -hmm. How do we keep people involved in their humanity and uh, stop them from just being functions. I, I know I do that at a restaurant uh, rather than allowing the waiter to just be a, serv a servant in, uh, in the role. I try to engage that person at least by name and make a moment right. come alive where there is humanity rather than simply function. Well, in, in this case, it's not only kind of 
um, moving through a quagmire of your life, but caregivers and sharegivers suffer mightily. They suffer mentally, emotionally, and physically uh, to a greater extent than the general public because of the things you just uh, uh, yep. spoke of. And, and part of what we wanna do on, on its most basic uh, level is make sure people understand there's a lot of people going through what they're going through. Absolutely. And sharing is not a difficult thing. We wanna make it a simple thing uh, just to reassure them that they're not alone. Well, just to pick up on one fragment of what you're saying, we have a concept of vicarious traumatization. So I'm working with somebody who is traumatized and I start feeling a sympathetic reaction inside myself because maybe I recall trauma that has happened to me in my personal life. How do I stay empathic? understand that I can have compassion for this situation without being sympathetic and being overly involved. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily an easy thing so that the caregivers have the potential for vicarious traumatization and even informing them of the concepts could be helpful in helping them to maintain empathy without being sympathetic. Yeah. Right. Another thing that you talk about, and I, uh, it's much more complex than I would characterize, but using creativity and uh, metaphor and poetry and art as experiences that can really open up the patient's creativity and larger sense of themselves. And we think that, and I've had this experience myself, that while I may be struggling in my role, if I can make time for uh, poetry and looking at art and things that are very meaningful for me in gardening and music, it uh, changes the way I think about myself in that role. Well, we, we are not scientifically designed people from the outset. We are designed more from our limbic reson resonance, our ability to respond to signifying gestures and to symbols. And this is some of the basis of art. And art brings us alive and helps us to realize things that cannot be adequately explained from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. You need science if you're going to send a rocket to the moon or if you're going to compute the uh, hypotenuse of a right triangle, you need to know the formula. But to be in love or to be uh, altruistic or to be humanistic, we need to have art because that brings out something in ourselves that is transcendent. So yes, being able to practice one's art, if you play music and you're a share giver, if you write poetry and you're a share giver, if you appreciate uh, painting and you're a share giver, having the opportunity to do those things and to do that with the person who is impaired awakens within both people uh, an ascendant spirit, an ascendant force, uh, a feeling of resonance that uh, can revitalize some of the parched uh, earth that exists in the situation. Mm. You, you spoke about empathy and we talk about it a lot. And I've worked in situations with, you know, uh, quadriplegics and people in just dire circumstances, as well as children who have been, who are suffering PTSD from their house being destroyed by Storm Sandy or whatever it may be. And, and, and women, mothers who have lost kids in Afghanistan in battle. And all of these people at some point felt desperation. And, I, and, and I've spoken with some child psychologists as well. And what I've learned and what seems consistent is that in some cases, uh, the, the, the antidote for desperation is helping someone else, someone else, whether it's a child being asked whether mommy is okay, or maybe mommy can use some help. And that's part of what I think, I think that's at play here um, is awakening that 
empathy gene in us. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I think that was really sage what you were saying, that we are social creatures and we do have an altruistic spirit and we do have a tendency to reach out and help someone. We also have a selfish gene and uh, looking after our own interest, but which gene we activate is a matter of difference, is a matter of meaning. So we, we look for a moment where we can step up out of the despair of a situation that is fraught with despair. And what is it that we can do to help somebody else? And that is uh, certainly a transcendent moment, a meaningful moment. Yeah, I think it's at the core of the networks that we want to create. We find over and over. Uh, you meet somebody and you might say, how's Barbara? And they said, you yeah, know, she's okay. Well, you know, I'm available. I'd love to help. That's beautiful. But then you don't hear from them. And you, as the caregiver, aren't really inclined to call them. And you stay stuck. And every time... We are now, it's interesting, based on our first podcast, who listened to what we, you listened to, all these people are coming and saying, put me on your calendar. Oh, beautiful. And uh, so Rob and I realized that the caregiver, by enlisting that kind of support, is giving people a chance to help which is really enlivening for them, not just the caregiver. Well, it it it. Uh, makes it okay to ask for help. Yeah. Which is a very hard thing. I've, I, I mean, I'm sure you know better than anyone. It's a difficult thing for people to say, I need help. Yeah. Uh, it associated me to uh, one of my senior colleagues and uh, someone whose work I admire, Philip Zimbardo, mm -hmm. and he has a heroic imagination project. <laughs> Hmm. and uh, wow. helping people to realize that they have an internal hero and they can access that internal hero. And when we see acts of disregard or disrespect uh, or violence, what can we do that helps us to access that hero? Because it activates other people to act similarly hmm. and to appreciate themselves in the process. It's not that we're devoid of personal satisfaction when we do something for somebody else and we reach out to help somebody else. Um, that's a, a matter of, of intrinsic uh, pleasure, intrinsic self-satisfaction. And uh, given the opportunity, people can rise to the occasion, but sometimes they need a prompt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, an, an issue that I've wrestled with forever, a question, and I've asked theologians and and now that I have you here um, you you talk about um, trauma bringing about change and transcendence I've I've worked with people as I said in, in difficult circumstances by and large they've told me how good life is and it just reminds me of how infrequently I hear that from so many people who are not in terrible circumstances and are miserable. So is, is there a way of, of making people- Artificial trauma? Not artificial trauma, but just reminding oneself of the blessings oh, instead of lamenting what we don't have. You know, the, the human brain is a mismatch detector mm. and biologically designed to notice what's wrong in any given situation. Mm. If you um, eat a good berry, you might not remember if you're a caveman, but if you eat a bad berry, you have to know that. So the brain is designed to notice what's wrong in any given situation. And it's not necessarily designed to appreciate what is right. Mm. And it's amazing that, uh, you know, we had post toasties or yogurt for breakfast this morning and we're having this conversation today. That's a freaking miracle and life is an amazing gift. And uh, we can't keep that in mind because we get angry at the person who cut us 
goes off when we were driving to work and we can't get that out of our mind because mm -hmm. we're so attuned to the mismatch. So when we can begin to resonate with the uh, beauty of uh, the earth and the beauty of life and be able to hold that more constant, it makes it a better world for you and me and everyone. And it's not necessarily an easy thing to do because we get entrapped into some of the basic biology that has guided us that we haven't adequately evolved out of. Um, and then there's a spirit of, you know, being able to be altruistic, which seemingly does have some genetic uh, predisposition. Like if you have a flock of birds and there's a predator that is coming after the birds, one bird calls out and that bird be may become the target of the predator, but saves the flock. So there's a, 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 there's a spirit of transcendence and heroism in all of us, and that can be appealed to and activated. The Chinese have a concept uh, when, you, when you're speaking in Chinese and you want to say uh, crisis, you put together two kanji, one for danger, one for opportunity. If you put danger and opportunity together, you get crisis. And it's the opportunity to either step up in your practice or to decompensate and uh, regress back to a more uh, primitive level. So we want to understand that there's an opportunity there and be able to recognize what is the opportunity and how can I be better at being myself by virtue of dealing with this adversity. Jeff, the almost the opposite of the altruism or doing for others is doing for oneself. Yes. And if this is another huge issue, it seems to me, for caregivers who suffer, you know, from uh, their own inadequacy, and then they wish they weren't in the situation, and they wish their life was better, is how uh, would you counsel caregivers to seek their own benefit and to uh, make their own lives better, almost in parallel with this job of caring for somebody else and reaching out to other people because it's the other side of the coin, isn't it? Yeah, well, anybody can do thing and do something in a perfunctory way. And uh, it, it, you can compose music in a perfunctory way and you can compose music in a way that represents something new and creative that, that you're doing. And people need to feel appreciated. And if that appreciation needs to come from the outside, it doesn't take a lot of appreciation to be able to water some parched earth. And yes, people get burned out by some of the routines that are necessary to follow when you're a caregiver. But um, the family providing just a little bit of illumination you know, this, this Cinderella effect where um, we know from studies of social psychology that if something is done in the environment just to fix something, that the employees will feel like the management really cares and feeling that the management really cares increases productivity more than doing lectures about how do we increase productivity. So caring there's a Kenneth Patchen poem, Caring is the Only Daring. That's the entire poem. Wow. And uh, uh, it's a, a great motto to live by. And just spending a little extra time of appreciation and caring can mean the world to somebody and can really uh, uh, improve the difficulties of the uh, humdrum uh, role of uh, trying to feed somebody who has difficulty in feeding themselves, et cetera. In, in general, so can thank you. Yes. I mean, I have found thank you to be more valuable than, you know, five bucks more an hour. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and why do we have to think about that in order to show human kindness? And it's, uh, so, Jeff, what, what part of this and how much of this 
enters into your daily teaching and thinking and speaking? Are these topics that come up in your work either with therapists or clients who come to see you? Well, um, you know, some of the intricacies of my work are probably what you face as a documentarian. You know, how can you take a, a topic and increase the density of the experience so that it makes the message that you have come alive? Mm -hmm. And that you can use uh, scripting, lighting, uh, uh, you know, dress, all of the other facets that you use. And so my area of inquiry is the same for therapists. How can they increase the density of their communication as a way of promoting their own creativity and in making the message that they have more effective? So my area of inquiry in my field is very circumscribed. And uh, the areas that you're talking about are more universal. Uh, you know, how, how do you help a population that has been ignored and has just been uh, treated in a way that's pro forma? And uh, yes, okay, let's just call up the agency and get somebody to help and they'll come yeah. in and everything will be okay. And the family can solve this with money. But yeah. um, this is... Uh, really uh, about love and about spirit and humanity and how can we bring out the best in ourselves and others and uh, the that's really the the goal of all psychology how can we bring out the best in ourselves and others and uh, sometimes uh, we get lost in uh, the forest of uh, intricacies that uh, are really not central to our life's mission. Bring out the best in yourself, bring out the best in others. And the two of you uh, seem to be, um, in, uh, you know, brothers in not only your, your heritage, but also in your mission. Let's bring out the best. You know, the, the word that often occurs to me in my role is how can I flourish while yes. I am? Well, that's bringing out the best exactly. in yourself. And, yeah. and that word, it almost seems to be an overstatement. Well, is it really possible to flourish when you're in this kind of a role? And I think that's a mindset that we are trying to address, but it does, um, I think it can be misunderstood by people as well that uh, to the extent you appear to be flourishing or you are enthusiastic or you are happy in your life while you're taking care of somebody that is so severely impaired. And yeah, I just came back from being in Vienna and uh, I have friendship with the Viktor Frankl family and mm -hmm. knew Viktor Frankl yeah, wow. and, uh, as a professor of psychiatry and neurology in one moment and being threadbare in a concentration camp in another and having a philosophy that you could be meaningful and that Maslow was wrong. And Maslow, Abraham Maslow said that you needed to have your basic needs met before you could do things that were transcendent. And Fra Viktor Frankl knew that in the concentration camp in the most threadbare of all circumstances, he could still be meaningful. They could take away every dignity that he had had, but they couldn't take away his right to create meaning, that that was intrinsic to him. And uh, not everybody finds that temerity, uh, but certainly he could demonstrate that even under those circumstances, people were capable of not just folding in favor of the context, but be able to find something within themselves that was bigger than their circumstances. And it's not easy and uh, really um, to try to find that yourself is not easy. Right. And it's nice when you have supportive family, supportive friends, supportive colleagues who can help you to appreciate what it is that you're doing. That's why that triad in your uh, overview is so important that there's the ability to seek external resources 
and have people around who will appreciate what it is that you're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's also, and Victor Frankl, I mean, that book, Man's Search for Meaning is so extraordinary. What an opportunity for you. But the idea of belonging, you know, which when you're building a network, you are advancing also that very important sense that you belong to a greater group. As Rob was talking later, where we're hoping to build a sort of a mutual aid network of other sharegivers that can benefit from the solidarity that they feel. It's, it's hard to be alone. I can't even tell you how many times I've read Man's Search for Meaning. And there's some times that literature has more resonance than psychotherapy in helping people to, to realize the spirit that they have in their heart. I also uh, want to acknowledge Martin Seligman, whose work in positive psychology, and he wrote a book, Flourish, uh, about how can we uh, transcend uh, some of our circumstances and has a program for helping people to be more positive in the face of adversity. I think we should present those books on the, on the yeah, site. Yeah, and I know. And, and, and we will talk with you, Jeff, as well, A, as to how this can benefit you and, and what you would like to have us present just for people's resources on our site, but the, the two books you just mentioned, I haven't read them and I want to. I have, man, so yeah. I've read it many times. I'm, I'm not nearly as well read as either of you guys, but I've certainly spent a lot of time with people who are desperately hopeful to overcome difficult circumstances. Well, people that are- you did a documentary on that. Yeah, uh, man, many of them. Yeah. And, and that, those are important in awakening our own capabilities. It's not that these people have uh, a genius that we don't have. They just responded to circumstances uh, to step up and to find a center. Uh, do I have time for one more story? Sure, or, yeah. You're, we have unlimited time. Uh, I, I, I think it was... 1985, I was in Hong Kong and I was teaching and I was teaching for a Jesuit college. And the, there was a, a, a priest that I wanted to meet, Dominic Tang. And he was the Archbishop of Canton, except that Canton was Guangzhou and Canton didn't really exist anymore, it had been, been renamed. And he was in the hospital, a Jesuit hospital in Hong Kong. So my Jesuit priest took me through the back door of the Jesuit hospital so I could spend an hour with Dominic Tang. He had exhausted himself on his North American tour. He was the emissary of the Pope. The only thing that he had in his hospital room was a Bible and a little brass ring that he got when he, from the Pope when he missed the conclave of bishops. I read his autobiography. It was my, his, uh, his, that his, inscrutable ways, not, not available as a book to read, but it was uh, uh, when Mao Zedong came in in the long march um, and the Anglican bishop fled, the Pope asked Dominic Tang, would he be the bishop of Canton? He couldn't refuse. And he was put into jail and spent 30 years in a communist Chinese prison camp. Many of those years we had to face a blank wall and recite Maoist propaganda in order to get a bowl of rice gruel. And uh, um, this man loved Christ. Uh, I'm Jewish, you know, and I, I could still feel the resonance of how much he loved Christ. And he didn't care if Christ had him in a prison camp or had him in the Vatican. He was going to serve Christ. And he spoke a number of different languages. I don't even know how that was possible, perfect English. And I got an hour where I could talk with him. Mm. And I said, you know, at the end of the time, you know, Father, uh, I, I'm uh, uh, Jewish and I've never asked for anything like that, but you, could you please offer me your personal blessing? And so he played, prayed for me in his hospital bed and perfect English, he autographed his that biography and to Dr. Jeffrey Zai, please pray for China, Dominic Tang. Mm -hmm. And it was such a reference experience for someone who had lived through hell and had 
this unshakable faith in Christ that I couldn't have myself because I didn't grow up into it, but I could appreciate it and love it, love what I saw in him. Mm. And it, it just leaves me with the hopefulness that when I'm faced with whatever adversity there is, that I'll, I won't necessarily find God in my equation, but whatever it is that I find, love or uh, contribution or meaning, whatever it is that I find, I, I want it to be there because I have seen people who have been able to do this, and I don't want to consider that they are remarkably unique people, but they have something that I have and something that I can resonate with. So I collect these kinds of stories about people like Milton Erickson and Viktor Frankl and uh, um, the Archbishop of Canton and try to use those things as a way of strengthening my own inner resolve. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially my purpose in presenting the people I've worked with is to inspire other people to uh, I don't know, be better, feel better, think better about themselves or exactly the same story. And what you're describing, uh, and I'm sure you use, I know you use stories in your practice, um, but that story was for your benefit. Yes. And, and you use that, it helps you and then you can help others. I had a similar experience with a close friend of mine who's unfortunately diminishing a little bit, and that's Marvis Frazier, Joe Frazier's son, and he took, took a lot of shots, and he's not quite the, the guy he was, well, none of us are, but 20 years ago, but he lost his bride, uh, a beautiful, stunning woman, um, remarkably giving and talented, and um, he was not angry with God, then, yep. his, then his daughter got sick. And fortunately, she recovered, but she dealt with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma shortly after that. And he was not angry with God. Right. And, and I, I knew going into it that I would certainly have questioned why me. Uh, he never did. And that to me was the most extraordinary display of faith. I'd yep. never really seen faith. Beautifully said, beautiful. In action. And yep. it, it made me at least recognize that's what faith looks like. Whatever the center point, if it's faith or creativity or love or contribution, whatever the center point is, that's the moment to bring it out. And that needs to be brought out in concert with others. Yeah, yeah Jeff, you know, you also use the word possibility, you know, that we need to believe that we have possibilities, maybe even infinite possibilities for our life. And that's part of being able to adapt and rise above these circumstances. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I make people understand they, they may be more than they think they are. Well, we are, you know, we don't know our own strengths. And that was where David started with this concept of utilization that psychological problems are believed in limitations and we all have a resource. We have a resource for being able to stop our bad habit. We have a resource for being able to be more kind in relationships. We have a resource for being able to change our emotions and we're not necessarily in touch with the resources that we have, but in dialogue with other people, we may be able to find those resources and bring them front stage, bring them center stage so that we can build on those resources. And uh, that's part of the work that I've been doing for 50 years. You know, mm. Jeff, this has been fantastic. This is all so deep in your knowledge and experience. I'm wondering if it's possible to fashion at some point, sort of like a master class where we can unpack some, some of these things in some order, specifically for family members that are, find themselves as caregivers. Well, uh, if uh, you know, I'm I'm at your service. If there's something that I can do to help, I think that the cause that you're promoting is really important. And uh, count me as a member of the team. Thanks. Well, I had two observations. One is it seemed that initially you weren't necessarily sure how you could contribute, 
Uh, I don't know how you could contribute more. Oh, that's super. That means a and, lot. And the other observation, and I feel it sort of from what I do, is that, I mean, so many people have obviously benefited from having met you and listened to you and spoken with you, but I would venture that you've benefited just as much from those Absolutely. interactions. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've been blessed by having uh, this opportunity to explore not only other people's uh, trials and tribulations, but my own and not only other people's uh, trials and tribulations, but their resources, which I can resonate with and feel more equipped to live a more meaningful life. Yeah. Right. Uh, is, is there anything else you'd like to... Uh... No, just that it's a pleasure to be with both of you, and uh, I uh, look forward to other opportunities in the future. That's great. We, uh, we do, too, I, and we really appreciate it. I couldn't be, couldn't be happier <laughs> to have met you this morning. Having uh, interacted here today was just fantastic. I, th I think so, too. I feel better about myself and hope that you feel better about you. Yeah, we do. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Jeff. I think one of these sessions we should try to have at the Brooklyn Diner. Uh, Yay! Which was where we first met. That was pretty good over a big fat pastrami sandwich. Corned beef. Corned corn beef. <laughs> Get your facts straight. <laughs> All right, Jeff, have a fantastic day. See you. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. We'd like to thank everyone for listening today and are so grateful to Dr. Jeffrey Zeig for his wisdom, insight, and expertise. If you haven't had a chance, please go to ShareGiverSolutions.com, tell us who you are, and share your thoughts, critiques, concerns, and your stories. They're important to us, as sharing is the way of caring, and singing is always good for the soul. Let's do it, brother. I got shoes. You got shoes, all oh, God's children got shoes. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes. I'm gonna walk all over God's heaven, heaven, heaven. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes. I'm gonna walk all over God's heaven. Right on. Right on.